Game review. Game review. Hello, my name is Caleb Denby, and welcome back to Game Review. Uh, in today's episode, I wanted to actually go over an amateur game and see if we could learn anything from it. Uh, so this was a game that was played right here at the St. Louis Chess Club in one of our weekly tournaments in the weekly nights. And this is a game between Caleb Gosden, who has a rating pretty similar to my own. He's making a push for the master title. And Vinny Toddy Party, a talented youngster who is part of our select chess program and is looking to, uh, I think, break into the 1800s, the 1900s, and, and beyond uh, in the near future. Uh, so that is to say, Vinny was the underdog in this match, but we'll see how both players approached this game. Uh, they started with d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, and after e4, black castles, white plays bishop e2, and black plays d6. So here we have a mainline king's Indian defense. And uh, I actually like this opening choice by, by Vinny here. Uh, the King's Indian, of course, is a very combative opening, a very imbalanced opening, and a very complicated opening. And against a higher rated player, I think that's exactly what you want to be doing. You want to make things complicated, uh, because if you choose a simpler position, the fact is, usually the higher rated player is just going to play it better than you. Whereas, if you go for a super complex position, where neither player knows exactly what's going on, the, the chance that one of you makes a misstep is, is a little bit more level. Uh, it gives both players the opportunity to mess up, and then it gives you the chance to capitalize on any mistakes if your opponent happens to slip up before you. Uh, with that in mind, the game continued. Bishop g5, not quite the main line now. Vinny develops his knight to d7. And white plays this move h4. And this is by no means the main move here. It's a bit of a sideline. And uh, black, I think, responded rather quickly with the reflexive h5. This is not my favorite choice by, by black. Uh, as they say in the, the back country where I come from, uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And there's also more than one way to deal with this h4, h5 push. Uh, a lot of us seem to have this just natural reflex. Uh, in this case, we respond to h4 with h5. Sometimes we respond to a4 with a5. It just seems like the thing to do. Uh, but in fact, uh, this is not the best way to play here for black. White is kind of wasting his time by playing this move h4. And so, as always, you can counter an, an attack on the wings with an attack in the center. And that's what Vinny should have done. And the move c5 is pretty nice here. Already claiming these dark squares, forcing white to make a decision. Generally, white plays d5 here. And you can imagine a6 to follow with b5 coming soon. And I hear you asking at home, well, what about this h5 move? Was it a threat at all? And the answer is, kind of. While h5 is nice, trying to open up this file, we do still have a very nice response to keep the file closed in the move h6. White really isn't interested in actually capturing this knight, because after knight takes, and if you want to take on g6 to open the file, you've really actually opened up uh, black's rook and traded off a very important bishop for, for your attack. So, after h6, this bishop would likely retreat, and we can manage to keep this file closed in this manner, playing h6 and g5. And this spends less time for black uh, than, than the other way around. And with this extra advantage in time, his plan on the queen side has been further advanced. All of this is to say, don't just believe your opponent's threats always. You know, you want to take every opportunity you can to play quickly, to play uh, important moves, whereas if your opponent is playing moves that are somewhat irrelevant, you can ignore them and continue with the more important central ideas. Instead, though, we see h5 from Vinny, a natural reflexive response. f3 from white is pretty nice. It controls the e4 square. Also might hint at some g4 pushes in the future. Knight h7 is Vinny's choice, getting rid of this annoying bishop. Bishop e3. And now Vinny continues with e5, which is one of the two main breaks in the center here. Uh, keeping in mind how white has actually played here, uh, I would have liked to see the, the other pawn break from Vinny, actually. I like c5 in these positions, where white has neglected to develop this knight and made some inroads on, on the king's side. When white commits things to the king's side, I like to play on the queen's side, and, and vice versa. So with c5, what uh, black is kind of saying is he wants you to play d5, and then he wants to expand with, with this type of maneuver here. 
And I think this is the better way to, to approach this position with black due to the fact that white has committed to the king's side. With e5, uh, black is kind of telling a different story. Black is saying, no, I still want to expand on the king's side, despite having you having committed some, uh, some time to this side of the board. And I just don't think that's, that's quite right. You want to play where your opponent is weakest. Uh, e5, not a terrible move, though. White responds with d5, taking the central space. And now rook e8 from Vinny, I do think, is a little bit uh, abnormal. Uh, it does make some sense to support this pawn, and we'll see why at a, at a later date, but I think there were more active moves that could have been played, such as a move like knight c5, or even a5, to prepare for knight c5. Uh, instead though, rook e8, this bishop comes to d3, eyeing this f5 square, this knight does come out to c5, this bishop drops back to c2, now we see a5, supporting this knight, very natural. Uh, white finally develops this king's side knight, and black continues with his plan of f5. And once again, I really don't think this is, uh, this is the main plan that black should be focusing on here. Uh, white, having committed a lot of his pieces to controlling this king side, uh, is much better prepared to handle this f5 push than he normally would be. And because of that, white is actually able to capture this. And after bishop takes, white goes in for a very forced line, bishop takes c5, and d takes c5. And now, the general rule of thumb is if white can capture on f5 and maintain control of the e4 square, he's doing quite well. And that really rings true uh, in this case. Uh, he controls e4, and after knight e4, it's very clear that this bishop's going to be a little bit locked out of the game, and white's going to have a firm grip on the position. Uh, Vinny plays b6, Caleb responds with knight 4 to g3, which is not actually my favorite move. And so if you at home want to take a guess to see how you think black could get back into the game, this was, this was really his opportunity. And it might help to keep in mind the square that I just mentioned being extremely relevant to this position. Okay? Hopefully you found it. The idea for black is to do a very interesting pawn sacrifice, pawn to e4. Uh, this was Vinny's one and only opportunity, really, to get back into this game. Uh, like I said, this pawn being stuck on e5 is really a shame for black. It blocks this bishop, and it blocks this rook, and it really makes all of the black pieces just kind of cramped. They're, they're not doing much. They're not, they're not active. They're not attacking things. And so by moving this knight from its e4 outpost, it gives black this opportunity to push this pawn to e4. And while it is a sacrifice for the moment, you do pick up a pawn on b2, and let's say bishop e5, and something like queen d3. Well, the white knights are still going to be pretty active, and the white structure is actually favorable compared to black structure here on the queen side, this would have been a lot better way to, uh, to continue the game. This rook is very, very active, and the black pieces can find some purpose in life. Which really, that's all we want. Instead though, Vinny chooses bishop takes c2, and now after queen takes c2, this pawn is defended, and maybe black should still play e4 just as a uh, straight sacrifice this time, but it, it's much less good if you don't get this pawn on b2 in return. Instead, black plays queen f6, which is just leading to this very, very depressing position where you have this bishop that's stuck on the same color as all of these pawns for the rest of the game. Rook a d8 was black's choice, knight 2 to c3, queen f4, knight back to e2, takes, takes, knight f6, and now we get just a straight uh, end game where this bishop is much, much worse than this knight. King d3. Uh, black tries b5. It would be a huge mistake to take this pawn, obviously, leaving d4 behind. And after knight c3, uh, Vinny missed another opportunity to get back into the game. Uh, as you've heard me saying, this structure is not good for black in tandem with this bishop. So what white, re what black really wants to do here is mix up the structure, shake things loose, and create some more weaknesses on both sides so that his pieces can find activity. What he played in the game was the move b4, and this is the opposite of what he needed to do. This leaves his c pawn weak, and it leaves the white pawns perfectly connected and, you know, with, without any issue. Much better would be to take this uh, pawn on c4, and after king takes c4, now all of a sudden, white has things to worry about as well, such as this e, such as this d pawn, as well as this b pawn. After a move like rook b8, 
especially rook b4. All of a sudden, this king is getting a little bit too active. You know, it's, it's a little bit too far advanced, uh, feeling a little bit lonely out here on c5, maybe. And black is actually doing just fine in this endgame. Uh, so, another missed opportunity from Vinny, instead playing b4. We see knight e4, bishop e7, this king comes to e2. And I'm going to play through the next moves rather quickly, because it's a lot of shuffling by both players, where neither of them is willing to overcommit or willing to commit to commit at all, rather, to, to anything important. Black does bring this rook out to f4, eyeing the one weakness in the white camp, but after rook e4, we do see, uh, eventually, after g3, a trade of rooks. This king comes to e7. Uh, knight g5, rook b8, and this is where the real shuffling begins. Uh, b3 from white keeps things locked down on the queen side. Rook f8, rook f1, rook d8, king d3, rook e8, king e4, king f6, knight h3, king g7, knight f2, king f6, king e3, king, rook e7, knight e4, king g7, king f2, rook e8, rook e1. A lot of shuffling this game, but we'll see eventually something does break loose. In the ends, rook e4, rook e7, more shuffling. This knight comes back to h3, the rook comes to f7. Knight f2, rook f5, knight d3, rook f7, and black has hung a pawn. And this really spelled death for black. Of course, black could have maybe held on a bit longer with a move like king g8. And eventually, once both players got tired of shuffling, which might have never happened for all we know, white is going to break through with this move g4. This is the move that he had been avoiding playing in the hopes that what happened in the game would happen, meaning black losing a pawn uh, without him having to commit to anything. But after g4, the position is quite difficult for uh, black after all. h5 will eventually be coming, allowing this king some inroads into the position, keeping an eye on both of these weaknesses. It's going to be a tough game for, for black. Instead, though, we saw rook f7 giving up this pawn, and the rest is kind of history. Uh, black has to go in for this rook d6, Otherwise, moves like rook c6 and rook a6 are going to pick up all of the black queenside pawns. But this king and pawn endgame is dead lost, which we soon saw uh, here, where I think black resigned. Uh, with that in mind, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and I'll see you in the next episode.